Waters presents On the Box. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another edition of On the Box. And whatever you do, don't touch Cody's arm! Don't touch Cody's arm! Who's Cody? Cody is 12, going on 30. <laughs> and uh, he's got some serious road... Oh! Ray is in the building! And we also have a studio audience with us. is Shawna Ketchum and her son's Cody, nice who is shirt. 12. And uh, Kyle, who is 9. They are from Missouri. Rose Tabernero and Julie Tan from Stamford, Connecticut. Got to meet Rose at the uh, Jersey Fire Conference in July. <sighs> we can all calm down now. Cody's got some serious road rash. Kind of looks like Scotty. <laughs> oh, Scotty. Yeah, kind of looks... Oh. My bike to work about but, but Scotty's like 50 years older than Cody. Scotty's a mess. So Scotty's <laughs> skin tears easier than Cody's. Uh -huh. <laughs> but Cody was going down a hill on a skateboard. Uh -huh. Got about halfway down the hill. And realized, oh, I should have wore some protective gear. I'm about to die. And he ended up with some gnarly beef jerky on his elbow. Yeah. Well, you know, this is Scotty's fourth, oh! Scotty's fourth time. Well, there could be a coordination issue, possibly. Yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, I went in first to make sure that he was okay before I started making fun of him. But he yeah. is, he's hurting today. He's a mess. He fell down. I gave him three boom. Advils yesterday. And it three? Dulled, it dulled, dulled his brain for about two hours. He was really happy. Advil doesn't have anything in it that'll make you happy. Well, what kind of Advil do you give him? No, you <laughs> feel <laughs> it was Advil. No, it was, it was a little it blue was pill. Wasn't relatively it? happy compared to his misery a few uh, hours earlier. See, I take three Advils before I go to the dentist. Not after, but before. Is that before or after you put the toy cockroach in your mouth? Oh yeah, before. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis must uh, love you. I, yeah, I love. I'm, I like to make them feel down in the mouth. Thank you. Here, here for you. Thank you. Yes, I'd like some tea. All right. Should this we do it? Do you want to do a show today? This is, you, do you, know what? you weren't aware that you were on today. There, we had. Was, do you know why? We had a clerical error. Yes. And uh, we're not going to blame anybody but Anita. No, no. no. Nobody. <laughs> Anita. <laughs> Bring her in. Put the camera on. No, she you know what? Anita conveniently left for lunch about five minutes before the show well, started. Well, my note on my email said no on the box tomorrow. So I said, right. okay. And I, at, for you. I mean, the show I was going to go on. but I saw a text at 11.25, which is about seven minutes ago, saying you're on the box. Yeah. And I rode my bike faster than what Scotty rides his bike. <laughs> but and but Ron, you did it on level concrete. Scotty did yes, it on a he does, something. But um, Ron was waiting at door with my new your new 180 shirt, shirt. look yes. at that sporting the new 180 for interviews yes. shirt yeah, yeah pretty good very nice. a little loose string there there you go that was the hair of my chest it's the only one i had thanks a lot that's right i'm here for you <laughs> mark was bouncing back and forth <laughs> as we were trying to decide uh yeah, is ray gonna be here well yeah. ray, no ray won't be here today yeah. ray's on his way no ray won't be here he's <laughs> coming into the building we don't know there's anita anita <laughs> come on in anita <laughs> Anita, <laughs> oh, our lovely executive assistant, come she, in. She Anita, you're being here. ordered. You're eating she up showtime. She will show not time. come in. Oh. Come on. you got more chance of a snail crawling across the 405 at peak traffic than her coming it, in here. It can be done. A snail? A snail, sure. Yeah. Should we start? Yeah, well, I think it would be a good idea. Got the breath? Got yeah, I got my breath, yeah? yes. Okay, very good. I'm going to get a moment to talk to the congregation about abortion and hand out information. What should I begin with? I have two minutes. What do you say? What do you say, Ray? So repeat that. This is the first time I've seen today's notes. <laughs> say it again. <laughs> I was thinking as you read it, I didn't see today's notes. So I missed a second. Uh, because wait, wait. you didn't think you were going to be on the show That's today. right. Tell me what, what, what. Is it my blood pressure or is it the coloration? I mean, I feel like I'm really getting red. It's your blood <laughs> pressure. <laughs> I will get a moment, the person who writes, Yes. I will get a moment to talk to the congregation about abortion and hand out information. What should I begin with? What should I say? I've got two minutes. Show the I would Start say going 180 like a Frisbee? <laughs> <laughs> I'd begin with pastor. I need longer than this. <laughs> two minutes? That's all it's they got. It's 120 seconds. It I would, is, I would yeah. cut the cloth to fit. I would say, you know, we've, we're, we've got a holocaust in our nation. Uh, we are transgressing the, the sixth commandment. We're killing our children. It's a baby in the womb. We've got to make a stand for righteousness. And if you care about God and you care about other people, I'd like you to, what are they giving out? Uh, he just said information. I don't know. Oh, yeah. So please uh, s see me in the lobby and I'll make sure you get something. But yeah. you know, you know, you know what I would do? What I would, would uh, show the promo for 180. It's a minute and a half long. And then I would uh, uh, read some commendations for 180. So to spark the interest in the here's the audience's ears. 
and say, hey, you want to go to 180movie.com. You don't want to miss this. This thing is over the top. It'll blow you away, and uh, you won't be disappointed. So you got two minutes. Show a minute and a half uh, promo and 30 seconds of uh, commendations. Boy, that's what I was going to say, too. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> You know, I'm not. I'm going to a church on Saturday to speak at a men's breakfast. I'm going to have more than two minutes. I'm going to have about an hour, mm. and I will be doing a message on abortion. Oh, good. That'll yeah. be interesting. It's going to be taped. Uh, I don't know. It's been. I don't know. I don't know if we'll know. The title is uh, "America: The Modern Day Valley of Slaughter." <laughs> yeah, out of Jeremiah. Is seven. that Heman? Is that the name of the Valley of Slaughter? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Tracks don't work. <laughs> Who said that? Well, that's a good way to start. <laughs> that's the part the atheists are going to cut out. Tony said tracks don't work. <laughs> Let's get him. Pile on. No. Someone wrote in, what do I say to a professing Christian who walks up to me while passing out tracks and tells me passing out tracks doesn't work? Ask get away from me. No, 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 no. Ask no, them no, how no. they know. How do they know? Yeah, how do they know tracks don't work? Because we know people who God... God has saved using gospel tracks. One of them is sitting next to us. Yeah. Right? Right, Mark? In the, uh, over in the Yeah, uh, absolutely. The I mean, God used a gospel track to get a hold of my attention for sure. But I think of a Hudson Taylor, the great missionary, uh, who was saved from a gospel track. But I would, I would tell them exactly what you said. You know, how do you know gospel tracks don't work? I mean, God used a very big gospel track to communicate a very enduring message to his people. So when they say gospel tracks don't work, I think what they're trying to say is, I've never seen them work, or I'm afraid to hand gospel tracks out myself. But you can't make that blanket statement that gospel tracks don't work when we know they do. And I don't know of anybody that would absolutely agree with them uh, theologically in the use of uh, gospel tracks. You, you need to use them. Why do we use them? Because God uses them. Well, that's a good point. You know, God wrote the first gospel tract, a two-page tract, and he wrote it with his finger in stone. <laughs> that was a big tract. Now, how many... <laughs> How much did a pack of 100 of those stone tablets cost back what, then, do you think? The, the <laughs> Moses threw the first one down. <laughs> yeah, gospel tracts definitely, definitely work. A good, uh, good saying is that God uses tracts, so should we. He uses tracts to communicate. And the, the epistles were gospel tracts. They were yeah. written. Written, read aloud to the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I re remember a story of a lady who went uh, shopping for uh, food for dinner at an open air hmm. market many years ago and she bought a stick of butter she came home and unwrapped the stick of butter and noticed that there was writing inside the paper apparently in victorian england they didn't have a b c d letter codes from the board of health on the side of the stores what are you doing this for on our program <laughs> <laughs> he's trying to get us into trouble <laughs> we're going to get a letter from the post. So pope. anyways, <laughs> what was written inside that piece of paper that was used to wrap up the butter was a page from one of Charles Spurgeon's sermons. The mm. woman read what was written there Heard of that. and uh, came to faith in Christ. Another good point is if someone says tracks don't work, say, well, what does? What do you use to reach the lost? And you'll find out where their heart's at. Yeah, I'd rather do what I'm doing than not do what you're not doing. <laughs> yeah, it's hard <laughs> to work out. It sounded good. Somebody. Don't they, even they, go into it. Got one. Sound like right. very intelligent. All right, it's time for transition this. Oh. You ready, Ray? I think so. <laughs> I'm <on>. really prepared. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be good. All right, bring the picture up. This came in by, uh, was sent to us by Josiah Teeple of Des Moines, Iowa. You can see the picture there. Is this heaven? No, it's the $1 car wash. Ray, transition that into a gospel presentation. Go. You know, one thing that I have got a pet peeve about, and I always have an argument with my editors, and that is I like to use a capital for the name hell. I hate it when I see hell as a small h. New York isn't given a small h, as E and Y. Los Angeles is a small L and A. They're places, and hell is a place. And what we've got is a world that uses maxims or little sayings about heaven and hell, as sure as hell, hell's teeth, uh, and all these sort of sayings. And they don't believe in hell because it's not preached in the pulpit. And consequently, we've got people saying, this is heaven. Get a car wash. No, it's not. Heaven is a place. It's not a state of mind. <clears throat> and if you die in your sins, you won't go to heaven. You've got a very real place called hell. That'd be my transition. Mark? Top that one, buddy. Go yeah, great. <laughs> that, that was pretty good off the top of your head. Uh, <laughs> I you know, think I so. think of, uh, I once heard somebody say, I've never seen a hearse haul a U-Haul. Right? So I've never seen a U-Haul come across uh, being dragged behind by a car uh, that had a dead body inside of it. And that kind of reminds me of... Uh, the fact that it doesn't matter how nice your car is or how many possessions and stuff you have inside this world. In fact, the Bible says, what would it profit a man if he gains the whole world, yet he forfeits 
his own soul. And though that car wash, it seems to be pretty cheap, that's unlike salvation because salvation ain't cheap. It costs God everything. And though it's free to you, it still costs God everything. Do you have any idea, in fact, what God did 2,000 years ago? Why did God become a man 2,000 years ago in the person of Jesus Christ? Any idea why? And then from there, I might transition into the law, then the gospel, but just kind of a different approach for sure. Very good. Yeah, I see uh, that picture as a marquee on many churches in America today. Oh, yes. No, this isn't heaven, but hey, we offer everything cheap. We've got a cheap gospel. We've got cheap grace. We've got uh, cheap salvation, and we sell it all cheap. So that's not a transition. I just felt like waxing eloquent about... Oh, waxing car wash. Waxing car... Oh, <coughs> hey, I thought transition was supposed to be Wednesdays. It was, but today's Thursday. What if, uh, well, we, we transitioned. Wednesday. We transitioned. I forgot to put it in Wednesday, okay? <laughs> uh-huh. right, Be sure job. your sins I will find you out. Yeah. Next question. Mm. My pastor rebuked me for having righteous... <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. I wonder where you learned that from. <laughs> what? He probably saw you yelling and did it in church. I, you should only yell in church if you're standing behind the pulpit. Mm-hmm. My pastor rebuked me for having righteous indignation. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't write this. No. I didn't write this. My pastor wouldn't rebuke me for righteous indignation. So the pastor had righteous indignation about... No, yes, about righteous indignation. <laughs> yeah. He was indignant about the righteous That's indignation. Right. Yeah. And he also said that he is not interested in evangelism. How should I respond to that? I want to leave my church, but my husband does not. Convince your husband to leave the church. It's not a church. <laughs> That's true. Convince your husband to leave the church. What does he like about the church? That it doesn't want anything to do with evangelism? Yeah. <laughs> what do, you, I, do you think a pastor who actually says, I have no interest in evangelism, do you think that man yeah. could possibly be soundly saved? There's another way to put it. I don't care if people go to hell, is what he's saying. Yeah, that's what he's saying. I've got no love. I'm what Spurgeon would call a murderer. Yeah. So I'd check with, my, if, if I was a woman, <laughs> forget it. I would check with my husband. Uh, as to why he wants to s- forget it. No, why, I, <laughs> no, why, okay. why he wants no. to stay within the church. Yeah, That's why? what I would do. Why, why does your husband want to stay mm, in yes. a place that has yeah. no care uh, for the lost and where people will spend eternity? Maybe it's time to share the gospel with your husband. Yeah. Because if your husband knows that he is putting his family under the teaching of a man who in all likelihood knows neither the Christ nor his word, then it might be a good time to share the gospel with your husband. That's right. Uh, that's right. That's right. Um, because that pastor will reproduce of his own kind right. in the pews. Yeah, false conversion doesn't begin in the pews. It begins in the pulpit. Right. Mark? Yeah, you know, I might uh, ask the pastor in love. Pastor, um, you've taken care of us through the word. You've uh, shown a lot of concern and compassion towards us. We love that. But can you show me biblically why we should not be interested in evangelism? You say you're not interested in evangelism. Does that mean... None of us should be interested in evangelism. And if only certain uh, individuals should be, who are those people and how do we know who those people are? You know, because the Bible says we are to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know, Paul told Timothy to do the work of an evangelist. So he wasn't an evangelist, but he was told to do the work of an evangelist. So how do you pull yourself out of there and how can anybody pull themselves out of there? I'm just curious as to your take on that. And your pastor should be willing to be able to receive a little bit of a sword fight like that. They're not above uh, correction. So say well, it in love and humility and see where, where he goes from there. I don't know about this pastor, though. He doesn't like righteous indignation and he doesn't like evangelism. So he's not going to accept <clears throat> righteous indignation about evangelism. And he won't be evangelistic about warning people about righteous indignation. So yeah, it's going to be bad. It's going to be leave, interesting. Leave, leave. You got to leave. You, you got to leave. Take your husband. Take, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest of your family, if you have one. Since we're talking about heaven, our sign had something to do with heaven. We're talking about a pastor that doesn't care whether or not people go to heaven. How do you know there is a place such as heaven? I was talking to someone, and when I mentioned if he, if I asked if he's going to heaven, he responded by asking, how do you know there is a heaven? Should I point to the Bible and then inevitably talk about why we believe the Bible is true or something else? I would do something else. What would you do? What I would do is say, look, we've got the greatest authority on the face of this earth that tells us heaven exists, and that's the word of God. If you have the word of a, a governor, you've got a high word. Word of a king, you've got a high word. We have the word of God. But let me ask you a question. Do you think you're a good person? I'd go straight to his conscience and not try to convince him intellectually a place called heaven exists. 
If you go through the commandments, you can convince him through logic and reason and through his conscience that hell exists and make him desire to go to heaven. It's called salting the oats. If the horse has got no desire for oats, you just put a little bit of salt in the oats and the horse will... No, no, no desire for water. You put salt on the oats and that gives him a desire for water. Yeah, hmm. true. Mark? You know, it gets back to how do, how do you know anything? How do we know anything? You know, uh, tell me one thing you know and how you know it. You know, if I were to ask you, where were you five minutes ago? You say, well, I was uh, walking down uh, the street. I'd say, how do you know that? Well, you took a memory test two weeks ago. How do you know you took a memory test? You know, I mean, how do, how do we know anything? You see, the, the Bible, which transcends time, tells us everything we need to know. And it talks about this God that transcends time. And the Christian worldview is the only worldview that makes sense Logically, every other worldview is going to paint itself into a corner. I mean, how do you know New Zealand is a real place? Have you ever been to New Zealand? Yes, Ray, don't answer yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. See, I knew you were going to say that, so I said, Ray, don't answer that. No, right? okay. So how do you know that? Well, because people no, have told you question. New Zealand exists because you've seen a picture of New Zealand. Well, how do you know that's New Zealand? How do you know you're not in the center of a matrix somewhere and this is not reality? See, you rely upon your senses, but your senses can deceive you. You know, have you ever seen uh, water at the end of a road? You go, yeah, I have. Well, come to find out, you probably did, and it was probably some sort of a, a mirage or a reflection of some sort. You put a pole inside of a water, it looks like the pole is bending. Your eyes are telling, that, telling you that the pole is bending. But your logic tells you that, no, it can't be bending. So what do you rely upon? It's this little word called uh, epistemology, you know, the study of knowledge and truth. Where do we get it from? And if you don't have the Bible as your foundation, then you have no foundation that will remain in the end. So this whole thing could be a dream and I rushed in for nothing. More like a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Since we're on the topic of the Bible, we'll take one more question about the Bible, and then we're going to go into the chat room for a little extra Q&A with the chat room. So get those questions coming, you live chat room faithful the folks. Chat chaps. The chat chaps. <laughs> what should I say to someone who says the Quran has the same credibility as the Bible? The guy who said this was not a Muslim, but thought that the Bible couldn't be trusted. <laughs> I would go for his conscience once again. Yeah. I really would. You that, it's just crazy. Some people say some craziest thing. This craziest things. We call them cut and pasters. Yes, Affectionately. That's, yes. They're cut and pasters. They're uh, clones from Dawkins. Yeah. Mark, what would you say? Yeah, you know, I'd say, how, how do you know that, um, that their book has the same credibility as the Bible? Define credibility for me, if you would, because um, the writings inside the Quran it will encourage you to be dishonest in their proselytizing. Do whatever it takes to try to win converts over. Well, that's not written inside the Bible. So if you would say that's credi credible to you, I would say that's not credible to me. Well, who gets to win on their credibility chart? But more than all of that, I would go for their conscience. And to do so, I would ask them, are you Muslim? No, you're not Muslim. Okay, well, I don't want to talk about Islam right now. Why? Because it doesn't interest either one of us. What is your worldview? What do you think happens after we die? What does somebody have to do in order to go to hell? I mean, everybody thinks they're going to heaven, but I'm curious, what are your thoughts on what somebody has to do in order to go to hell? So, you know, you could just kind of mix it up a little bit there and uh, try to deal with their worldview, because if it's outside of Christianity, which obviously it is, once again, it's going to paint itself into a corner. But you go for their conscience, and if you have to tickle the intellect, then you can do so. But you more than likely will not need to with an individual like this. Just go right for the card. So I got a question mark. Yep. You're growing a question mark. <coughs> yeah, I got a question mark. <laughs> um, are you growing a beard? You know, I'm not. You, you know what woke me up this morning? It was <laughs> the sound a of your beard text. growing. <laughs> it was, what, it was a, a text, text from uh, one of the guys in the carpool saying, I'm out front to pick you up. Oh, and I you went, woke up late. Ah. <laughs> so I went running into the closet, grabbed my stuff, and ran out the door. Oh it took me about a minute and a half to I do so. I know that feeling. So I didn't <laughs> shave. Well, my, while Mark is uh, gathering up a question or two out of the chat room, I want to let you know that uh, because of the chat room faithful here at On The Box, who were asking for red 180 shirts, we are going to make red 180 shirts I'm available. I, I'm really happy about that. Yeah, I Are wanted you? red and black. Yeah, because yeah. that's the colors, and uh, we decided not to. And we just wanted well, to. Isn't the lettering going to be? Is the lettering going to be black or white? Uh, we'll go across to the both. It'll be both. Yes. Be both. Both. Oh, that's black and white. It's black and white. It's red all over. <laughs> <laughs> Never touch the biceps; you'll break your fingers. Okay. Oh, that hurt. You know, got some Cody Road rash on my finger after <laughs> that one. Yeah. All right, what's going on in the chat room? 
All right, quite a few things here. Um, Tony, how many tracks do you generally use in a week? Question number one. Oh, wow, that varies. I mean, I, it might be a couple a day. It might be a couple, of, couple thousand, depending on where I'm at. Um, and what I'm doing. I usually hand out fewer tracks when I'm open-air preaching just because I'm spending a lot more time on the box. On the box. On a lot the more box. Time, time preaching. <coughs> but uh, uh, I, I cannot say that if you ever catch me without a tract, um, Ray will give you $1,000. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, so I don't, I don't know if I have them on me constantly. I always have some in my car. Um, try to, I always have a trunk full of stuff so I can <laughs> get out and open-air preach if I see a line waiting to be preached to. But, yeah, it would vary from, I don't know, a dozen to a couple of thousand, depending on what's going on. And it depends whether you take them out of the shrink wrap or not. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, it, it's so expensive to hand someone a pack mm. of million-dollar <laughs> bills. Here, have a hundred of these. Read at least one. <laughs> yeah. Mark, how about you? You know, well, if you're with Ray Comfort, you, I, I don't hand out one track. Because that guy hands a track oh, yeah. out to every yes. single individual. Yeah. It, it's, it's absolutely nuts. So, you know, it depends. I mean, are, are my kids with me as well? Because I cannot cross the path of an individual without handing them a track. My kids remind me of that. <laughs> if we're about ready to go inside Costco or someplace, my kids are all saying, Dad, can we have tracks? Can we have tracks? And I load them up with tracks, and I don't have to hand out any tracks as well because they themselves are handing out a ton of tracks or placing them in strategic places like cases of beer or... Uh, any other place. So okay. I guess the Duggar family <coughs> don't give out tracks to parents. Wow. Yeah. <coughs> They've got 19 kids to Nine, give out the yeah. tracks. That's an army. That's an evangelistic army. All right, what else are we going to talk about? All right, so question number two. How long should one spend answering smoke screen questions before you give out the gospel? <coughs> Do they give an example? They did not. Oh, yeah, well, I... Are they, I think maybe they might be asking oh, someone trails. Who's, yeah, someone is just <coughs> asking questions for the sake of argument. Uh, mm. Once you've been on the streets for a little while, you could tell, you know, if this person is sincerely asking you a question or if they're just looking for a fight. You know, if someone comes up to you and says, hey, okay, I hear what you're saying, but I got a question. What about the dinosaurs? What does the Bible have to say about the dinosaurs? Or someone walks up to you and says, dinosaurs! What about the dinosaurs, huh? Answer that one! Well, obviously, the second person might not be as interested in a conversation. So with the second person, I'll say, hang on. If I answer all your questions to your satisfaction... Our neighbors are going to come in here and say, where's the dinosaurs? <laughs> if I answer all your questions to mm. your satisfaction, are you going to drop to your knees, repent, and believe the gospel right now? Well, and <coughs> 99 times out of 100, the answer is, well, no, of course not. Well, then I'm going to move on and have a conversation with someone who actually is interested in the conversation. Um, you, you do it politely, but you're not obligated to spend any time at all with someone who really doesn't want to have the conversation, and we ought not be casting our pearls before swine. Right. So, so you started the game so you can call the play. Um, you, can ha you can say what you want to talk about. And a great example is Jesus, where the, where the Pharisees came and says, we want to know this. Tell us about this. And he says, I'll ask you one question. Yeah. He turned her around because he had strength of character. And you'll find you can do the same. You just call the play, say, I'm not answering that. Yeah, I can answer it later. I want to talk about this. And if they don't want to talk about it, just let them leave. Because you're calling that the play. Yeah. Mark? All right. Next question. How does a man share his faith with a woman? That's a... <laughs> <laughs> what? What's so funny? Uh, yeah. That's, that's a, a great question. Great question. Yeah, that is a good that question. That is a good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is how. Hello, ma'am. And then I do what I do with a man. What do you... Well... You talk gently. You don't yell. Yeah, I try not to yell. <laughs> is, that what, is that the difference? No, no, no. I, I, maybe the question has more to do with, you know, is it appropriate for a man to go up to a woman and engage her in conversation? Oh, you mean approach a, a woman? I sat next to a woman for an hour and a half recently and shared the gospel with her. Well, that's a captive audience. I mean, in the she, plane. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Neither one of you had a choice. So you should, the question really sitting. is, should a Christian approach a woman to share the gospel with her, and how do you do it appropriately? Yeah, I think that's more like yeah. that. Okay. So what would you say? Oh, just be... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what would you say? I, I just I, go I'd up say, to women and chat with them. Well, I, I would say, one, be very, very careful. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to, um, and I'm talking to men, you, you don't want to approach uh, a woman in such a way where she feels like she has no way out of the conversation or she has no way of escape from your approach. You don't want to ever corner a woman um, you know, in any way. You don't want them feeling like they're, uh, at risk or being threatened in any way. Hmm. Um, or you're trying to pick them up. 
Yeah, I, I think it's a good idea. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's a good idea to go out with partners mm -hmm. uh, for your own protection, uh, for protection from false accusations. Because, uh, you know, if you're engaging a member of the opposite sex in conversation, they don't like the way the conversation's going. They could just run over to an officer security guard and say, hey, that, that man or that woman propositioned me, you mm -hmm. know, and, and I, want them, I want them kicked out or I want to call the police. So it's, uh, I think it's prudent to have a, a partner with you. That's one of the reasons why I love taking my daughters out with me. So because what about approaching two women? Yeah, that, I think that might be a, a, a little better because mm. she's not alone. Mm. You know, so, uh, but yeah, yeah, I think you have to use discretion. I think you have to use caution. I try to avoid, if I'm in a one-to-one -one conversation with a woman, I, I, I try to avoid the seventh commandment. I don't want to talk about sexual sins mm. uh, with, with a woman. If my wife isn't there, you know, with me or I have another uh, lady uh, uh, there with me uh, as part of my evangelism team. Mm. And, you know, there are many other commandments we can talk about. So, mm. But, you know, use discretion, use caution, and, and don't do anything to make the woman feel uh, unnecessarily uncomfortable by having you in front of her. Mark? Great. A couple open-air no. preaching questions okay. here. Uh, <laughs> why no sunglasses when we open-air preach, especially if we are looking right into the glaring sun? Why no sunglasses, Ray? Well, the light of the body is the eye, and I remember a, a friend of mine, his name was Graham Carley, who got up to preach in Christchurch, New Zealand. This is way back in the last century. And he was wearing sunglasses, and a, a guy just stood up in the crowd, and he walked right up to him, close to his face. He said, how dare you speak to me wearing sunglasses? He was offended just because he see, couldn't see uh, Graham's eyes when he was talking about the things of God. So um, sunglasses can disguise you think of jim jones remember jim jones oh, yeah. always wore sunglasses in front of his congregation you want people to see the sincerity your earnestness and how do you feel when someone goes past you in one of those cars that you can't see into you know those oh, what, yeah. what they call yeah. when they darken the windows yeah. something creepy about it and it's not good to, to preach so just say god please help me with a glare and preach earnestly and let them see the light of the the eye. Yeah, now if you have a situation where you have to wear sunglasses for medical reasons because of uh, some issues well, with your different. eyes, just let the people know you're talking to. Look, I, I would love to take off my sunglasses, but for medical reasons, I have to keep them on. Mm. But there are two, two rules of thumb in, in open air preaching. Let them hear the love in your voice. Let them see the love in your eyes. That's a good reason to take off the sunglasses. Mm. And we're out of time. So until tomorrow, be encouraged, strengthened, and unafraid. Proclaim the gospel. Living Waters presents On the Box.